Good morning. My name is Stanley Atkins II, your National Director of Hemp Farming and Technology for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful Saturday morning. We have a great episode for you today, but we want to start out by letting you know that Minorities for Medical, Mar Medical Marijuana is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a plethora of programs that are local, state, and national. Be sure to set your notifications. Follow us on all social media platforms. We can be found on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram at M4MM United. Be sure to turn on your notifications so when we go live, we have these virtual updates, these virtual events, you can be sure to tune in. Again, Back to the hemp conversation. I am your National Director of Hemp Farming and Technology, and today we have a special guest for you. As many of you know, the hemp industry is rapidly expanding and it's rapidly growing, not only domestically, but internationally. And with that growth comes a series of events, conferences, symposiums, webinars, and virtual events. Today, we bring to you a special guest. We're going to have on Mr. Morris Beagle, and he's going to be talking to us today about NOCO. What is NOCO? How can we learn more about NOCO? And where can you find NOCO, and how can you attend some of their events? So without further ado, I would like to welcome today's guest, Mr. Morris Beagle. Good morning, Morris, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Stanley, and good morning to you out there in Georgia, and hello from Colorado. Beautiful Colorado. Um, I had, have had the opportunity to visit Colorado, and I noticed, one of the first things I noticed about Colorado was people go to bed early, but they get up early. Like Things close early, but when you get up, your guys' mornings are so beautiful out there. Everyone's out working in their yards, they're biking, so I see why people enjoy the beauty of Colorado. It's a gorgeous state, and if you've never had the opportunity to visit, please set it on your calendar to get out there. If you're a person that enjoys it in the cold, go there in the winter, but the summer months are just as beautiful. So again, thank you, Morris, and I look forward to a great conversation today. Well, thank you again, Stanley, and yes, all are welcome here in Colorado, and we are a cannabis-friendly state here from not only hemp, but medical and adult use recreational as well. Absolutely. So without further ado, for our guests that are in attendance and those who may watch this a little bit later, Morris, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background that led you to where you are today. Well, what's funny is so I come from the music industry and I grew up here in Colorado uh, since I was six months old. I was actually born in Kansas, but I grew up on a farm till I was about 11 years old, um, played sports going through high school and or, you know, through junior high and high school, played golf, played football, played basketball. But I ended up going to uh, the Music Business Institute in Atlanta, Georgia, back in 1987. And so I lived in the Atlanta area from 87 to 91 and then was transferred out to, to California for four years and then moved back to Colorado in 1995. But I've been in the music industry or associated with the music industry for 30 plus years now. And one of the things that really kind of got me to the the hemp side of things is <clears throat> I did a lot of CD and DVD manufacturing and packaging, lots of jewel cases. And with this came a lot of excess throwing jewel cases and CBD or CDs into the landfill. And mm -hmm. as a human being, knowing what my own personal impact was by discarding all this over waste that the music industry was producing into landfills, all this plastic, um, triggered me into a more sustainable mindset. And when I discovered hemp, well, I discovered it back in the mid nineties, but after I decided to kind of transition out of the music industry, uh, 2010, 2011, and I was like, Hmm, hemp, here's something that potentially can be a, a replacement for a lot of the toxic things that we're doing as society, whether that's chopping down trees, uh, growing cotton that takes all kinds of pesticides or using petroleum for bioplastics and fuels. I mean, hemp is a is a crop that can replace so many of these toxic 
types of industries or inputs into these industries that we have to change these inputs if we want to have a future as humanity and as society. So that's kind of how I got led into the hemp industry, um, starting Colorado Hemp Company in 2012 when Colorado went to the first state to approve adult use recreational. And within that whole legislation, Amendment 64, there was opportunities for folks to start getting involved in the hemp industry here in Colorado. And so that predated the 2014 Farm Bill that really opened up the, the landscape across the country for states to participate in pilot programs and people to start growing hemp and start marketing it and figuring out how to commercialize it. Oh, wow. So, so what, you're, what you're telling us is that your introduction in hemp saw, came from you, you realizing your environmental impact from your industry. And for a lot of people, they think that hemp is a plant that can only be made for CBD or, you know, make some fiber, maybe some grain. And that eco-sustainability is important because as we realize more people are on the earth producing more trash than ever before, we have to be cognizant of our environmental impact. And if no one else has acknowledged it, I would love to say it thank you because there are so many brands so many companies and so many products that a lot of us use on a day-to-day -day basis where we don't realize the amount of trash we're accumulating and it all ends up on the ground at some point so with you noticing that and realizing the sustainability of the hemp plant i would like to say salute and kudos well, so thank you yeah and, it was like a come to jesus moment for me it's like wow as just one person, I have a tremendous impact on what's going into the earth. And I, with the with my own decision making, can make that change. And I have made some changes. I've, I'm doing the a better job than I was 10 or 15 years ago by making these changes. And I think each and every one of us has that opportunity to make changes in our day to day life, how we purchase products, who we purchase them from, how we use them, how we dispose of them. And so it's up to each and every one of us to to make our own change and to to create the world that we want to see in the future. Absolutely. Um, I really couldn't agree with that more. I think that the cannabis industry, um, as opposed to many other industries, we may arguably be the most waste producing industry in the world. Um, I've gone to dispensaries in different states, Colorado, California, you know, I've been to Nevada, Massachusetts, and especially after the inception of Prop 64 and some, you know, some of the other laws, and I realized that my, my product came in a package, which came in a bag, and that bag came into a, came in another bag. And when I got outside the dispensary, which I won't name, I'm looking, I'm like, wait a minute, I have a bag inside of a bag inside of a bag. And, you know, your pre-rolls in a tube, in a case that's in a bag that's also in that third bag. And you realize you get back to your your, your stay, your Airbnb or your hotel and you look at your trash can. It's full. The little small trash can is full of just your cannabis package. So that eco sustainability and us being not only socially coach conscious, but also environmentally conscious, because it is up to us if we're going to be in this space and producing using a plant that's known for natural remediation of the environment, we have to be cognizant of that. And I think that for more companies that are truly putting emphasis on their uh, ec economic impact, but also the environmental impact, these are conversations that need to continue to be discussed. So going back where you stated about your 2014 farm bill, I know we have the 2018 farm bill. From your experience, what was some of the impact that you saw from the 2014 farm bill? Also, the initial hemp bills that are in Colorado. Well, the initial one that was in Colorado basically allowed us to start growing hemp prior to the 2014 farm bill and there's a gentleman out here ryan laughlin who planted a crop in 2013 so he was the first hemp farmer in 56 years or something to actually plant grow and harvest any sort of hemp in america um, legally and that would be questionable the it was legal here in colorado the feds never came and did anything to him um, but we did get a head start and then when 2014 rolled around there was already a lot of farmers here in Colorado that were lined up to do it because of the state law. And then because of the farm bill, 
which Jared Polis, who was our congressman at the time, really came up with that language to get it into the Farm Bill, introduced it through the House there in D.C. Um, and then Mitch McConnell put it into the Farm Bill on the Senate side, but it actually came from Jared Polis, who is now our governor here in Colorado and who's been a champion of cannabis, a champion of hemp, and really provided Colorado with the foundation to be leaders in this entire cannabis space. While our system is not perfect here, there's still overregulation, and this plant is overregulated across the board. We're in a better position, and at least we've got an industry that is is up and operating across the spectrum from recreational, medicinal, and industrial. Although the medicinal side of things seems to be kind of going by the wayside in a lot of states, and ours included, because of the recreational side, and there's you can't buy this amount of concentrate and that's really not my forte as, as all this medical and adult use uh, regulation side of thing. I'm really more of the hemp guy, of course, support the entire plant. But we were given the opportunity to get things going here in Colorado a little bit ahead of the game. And, and it has provided us some advantages. And I think that we've done a pretty good job from a leadership role. You know, my whole thing isn't about, hey, Colorado's going to dominate. I want to see the U.S. be a thriving economic engine for industrial hemp. And I want it to connect with the rest of the world because I think it's very important that from a global standpoint that we up the production and we have millions and millions and millions of acres of hemp that's rotating in corn and soy, cleaning up the, the soil and the environment, growing it correctly without spraying a bunch of chemicals, Roundup ready glyphosate shit that ends up poisoning the the rivers and the lakes and the oceans and you know creating carbon in the atmosphere. We need to suck that carbon out of the atmosphere and back into the ground, and that's what hemp does. And it remediates the soil and it gives the soil the opportunity to to be living instead of dead. Absolutely. Um, to go back to one of your previous statements where you mentioned cotton, for those who know about the South, the Southeast, for hundreds of years, the Southeast is has been the leader in cotton for hundreds of years. Um, during the during segregation, during the during slavery, there was a lot of cotton. Cotton is one of our biggest exports here in America. Um, it's one of our largest textiles. And you and I both know, but for those who are in attendance may not know, it takes a lot to grow cotton. Again, back to your point, the pesticides, the herbicides, the insecticides, all of these chemicals have a significant impact on the environment. Because guys, whether you want to believe it or not, just because you're spraying something on the plant doesn't mean it's going to stay on the plant whether it's water, whether it's rain, or even animals carrying that bacteria, those chemicals into the soil, into lakes, rivers, and nearby bodies of municipal, uh, nearby bodies of water. And with hemp, we can truly clean up the environment. As you heard Morris state, hemp can be used to clean the carbon in the air. So imagine putting hemp farms or hemp gardens on the top of rooftops of buildings, even some of the garden terraces, as you've seen in Asia, they're shown that by the implementation of introducing plants into toxic air systems, it does buffer some of that air and some of the, and cleans some of the air. So these are things that I feel we need to truly continue to push the narrative on, but also expand that conversation. Now, I want to touch on some of your work with the WAFBA. So tell us, what is the WAFBA and what do you guys do? So WAFBA is WAFBA, which is We Are for Better Alternatives. And that is the umbrella of companies slash um, brands that, that we have created over the course of the last 10 years. Colorado Hemp Company, we created in, in 2012 which falls under the WAFA umbrella that we ended up creating in 2015 because I started creating these brands. And, and Colorado Hemp Company is kind of the engine that produces events, that has created these brands. It's a brand development brain of our organization. Um, Tree Free Hemp, we created in 2013, which is a hemp paper and printing company. We print business cards, flyers, posters, marketing collateral on hemp paper. No Co Hemp Expo, we created in 2014, which has developed into kind of the longest lasting hemp expo conference here in the United States. It's now the largest hemp expo conference in the world. Um, and in 2015, we created Let's Talk Hemp as kind of the programming and media back or media engine of NOCO Hemp Expo and our event platform. And that's grown into a really large um, 
recognized media platform for the hemp industry. We do a weekly newsletter. We create lots of original content. We focus on entrepreneurs and companies that are doing great things in the industry. We curate information from around the world that's going on in the hemp industry try to shine a light in a positive way on all the great things that are happening in the industry, as well as obstacles that we're facing from a regulatory and government standpoint, or maybe, um, you know, big industry that's pushing back against us and using the government to help put the brakes on the hemp industry, such as the pharmaceutical industry, who's had the brakes on us corn and soy and some of these other big commodities that are like, hey, you know what, keep the hemp industry at bay a little bit. We don't want them to necessarily get into the animal feed market. And this stuff does go on. I, I'm not sitting here just BSing people saying that, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and these big corporations, they don't really want hemp to come up and compete with them. It's the same thing as what it was in the 1930s, back when you know, the kibosh really came down on cannabis and, and it was made illegal by the pharmaceutical industry and other big industry titans that were like, you know what, let's just kind of get these guys off the playing field so we can dominate industry with our own, you know, diff whatever it was, whether that was going to be petroleum, whether that was timber, whether that was pharmaceuticals. None of those folks really wanted to see him jump into the mix as a real strong competitor. And that stuff's still going on. Absolutely. Um, from some of my work on the legislative front, even here in Georgia, I mean, it was several years ago, um, I was working with some colleagues and it was toward the, one of the end of the days, you know how it is in the legislative session. It's like the, the legislative stock market down there. There's conversation, there's people going every direction. And it was kind of towards the end of the day. And I was with one of my colleagues who's a hemp lobbyist and he had a hemp bill that he wanted introduced and we need a politician to champion it. So we go into one of the office, end of the day where the ties are kind of, you know, loosened up a little bit. Everybody's you know, kicking their shoes off in the office. And he approached them with a hemp bill and he went to talking about it. And one of them was adamant about pretty much what you just said. They stated, you know, we know the possibilities of hemp. You know, we told them about everything from hemp creek to paper to even animal feed um, to water filters. And exactly what you said, those industries that have worked tirelessly for almost a hundred years to keep hemp away from mainstream production, they were like, hey, what about the paper industry? What about the lumber industry? What about the building construction uh, industry? What about the sawmills and some of the material companies who contribute significant amounts to our campaigns? This would be a slap in the face to them. What would we look like legalizing something that could potentially put them out of business? And they quickly took that bill and here you go. I, I can't support this. And which is why we have to know who's playing the game, ladies and gentlemen. And what I mean by who's playing the game, who are the shot callers? Who are the decision makers? And find out who some of these check writers are. Some of your favorite agricultural and industrial companies have money put in every state to seriously block hemp. They don't like the hemp legislation. They don't want your car powered by hemp. They don't want your solar batteries powered by hemp. They don't want your house built with hempcrete. They need that energy blowing out of your windows, blowing from under out of, around your door seals. Why? Because that keeps them making money. Why would we want to increase your home efficiency when your home being inefficient makes us money? And again, we are for better alternatives. That's stating right off the top, we are for something better. So when you're talking to brands, ladies and gentlemen, and be sure to follow these brands, follow Morris, reach out to them, follow NOCO, because these are companies, if you're wondering who are the companies at the forefront of the conversation, looking to change the narratives and increase our visibility, it's people like this and Morris who are really leading that conversation. So, Morris, that leads me into NOCO. I've heard a lot about NOCO. Many of others who are in the hemp space have heard about NOCO. Some have may even attended some of the events. But for those who are watching today who may have never heard of NOCO, they don't know a single thing about industrial hemp. What would you tell them NOCO is? NOCO is a large trade show. We'll have several hundred exhibitors. We've got four conferences. We've got four stages. We'll have thousands of people that across the supply chain. We've got everything from farmers, geneticists, breeders, processors, equipment manufacturers, legal, politicos, uh, 
hempcrete, textiles, CBD, food companies, pet product companies, really everything that the hemp plant can do is represented at NOCO. And while a lot of it is still relatively in its infancy at this point, we're just getting started. And it has been, it's been a long road to get here. But like you already said, you know, this stuff, there's been industries that have got a hundred year head start on us. The timber industry, the petroleum industry, all these industries have built out infrastructure and have been subsidized by the federal government to build out this infrastructure. And they see hemp coming as, as, a, as a competitor. And hemp is a competitor. And we can do almost all of these other industries or utilize hemp in all these other industries for building you know, houses and buildings and paint and carpet and automobiles and plastics and all of this stuff. And we're just getting going and there's going to be opportunities for people of all walks of life to participate in this industry. It really is. Here's an opportunity for a brand new commodity to, to take place in this country. That's going to allow communities across the, the entire spectrum to participate. So that it's an exciting point in time, even though there's roadblocks out there, no co can provide you an opportunity to see what is possible in the future and how to participate in the future. So everybody is definitely um, welcome to join us. And I see Alexis Harris jumping hey, in. Alexis. Alexis and Coach will be out at NOCO. They're both speaking and two of my favorite people from Georgia right there. Absolutely. I want to say hello to Alexis Harris and her father, Coach Mike Harris. They have also been working in the hemp space here in Georgia, and I know they'll be speaking at NOCO. And I'm excited to see some of the feedback and see some of the work that they're doing. Because, ladies and gentlemen, just because you're in a state where these events aren't does not mean you can't be at these events. You know, it's good to travel. And when it comes to this conversation of industrial hemp and the vast potentiality of its industry, you can get a lot from social media. You can learn from YouTube, Google. But when it comes to the hands-on and handshaking, there are many times where you need to be in the room. Some of the breakout discussions, some of the panel discussions, and even visiting some of these vendors. So as you stated, NOCO is not just a trade show. They also have panels, conferences, exhibits. So for a person who is looking at entering this industry, get you a ticket to NOCO. If you want to educate yourself on this industry, get yourself a ticket to NOCO because this is one of the opportunities that you, your business partners, your associates will have to not only get the visual experience, but the hands on experience. There are many innovators and, for, and thought leaders such as Mars in this industry and events such as NOCO offer you the opportunity to talk to them in person and oftentimes. Some of the pages that you may follow, like you said, you've got hemp instruments and building materials. Well, you can only get so much from Google. You need to touch a piece of hempcrete. You need to touch a piece of hemp plaster. I know I was at an, an event last year with uh, Alexis Harris and some of her colleagues here in Atlanta, and they had one of our colleagues who's a big hemp supporter, Aviva Vuguzela, and she actually had a display there where children can come and make something out of a hemp plaster, whether it was a handprint, a heart, they could engrave on it, and they could have a little piece of hempcrete material to take home for arts and crafts. So, Morris, you stated that you guys are going to have a lot of speakers there, a lot of presenters. What are some of the topics at this year's upcoming NOCO that will be discussed that some of our viewers may want to come in on? Well, we've got a business conference and an investment forum on Thursday. And so that programming will discuss all the regulatory aspects, kind of here's the update, what's going on with regulations on a national level with the USDA and the FDA, compliance, labeling, important information as far as if you're going to be a product brand in the marketplace, um, how you get it there and the, the regulations that you have to follow currently based on what the FDA is saying, whether even though the FDA has been a little ambiguous as to trying to regulate or actually regulating CBD as a dietary supplement, food and beverage ingredient, although they, they haven't officially done that. A lot of states, including Colorado, we've implemented our own regulations and bypassed the FDA and more states need to do that. Um, but there's that side of things. There's what's going on on a global scale as far as exporting and importing opportunities coming down the pipe. 
Um, what's new and the latest and greatest in processing? Are we actually processing fiber and grain on any sort of scale here in the United States yet? We're starting to. It's starting to open up. We've got more and more decortication systems going in across the country. Um, the CBD side of the space, which has dominated for years, is now kind of taking a back seat. The bubbles popped on that. And you know, if you're looking to start a CBD brand, I would recommend holding off on that. There's was 4,000 CBD brands. Now there's like 1,500 after the last two years of attrition. Um, the future of industrial hemp is really going to be based around food, um, animal feed, construction materials, industrial plastics, papers, packaging, uh, carbon sequestration. But it's, it's kind of what Jack Harris said all along. It's food, fiber, medicine. It's everything. But don't put all your eggs in the, the CBD basket at this point in time. Um, also, we're going to be talking a lot about farming and ag tech. And then we're also going to talk about advocacy, uh, diversity in hemp. There's several diversify hemp panels um, talking about inclusion, how including everybody under the umbrella is only going to make this industry stronger and better and and have more legs to, to carry forward into the future. Because when we all get to participate, it's going to be better for everyone. Absolutely. I really could not agree more with everything you just said. Um, ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, NOCO has something for you. No matter what you do, what business you're in, what products you use, there is some way, form or fashion that hemp could make that product better. If not the product, the packaging, because there is proof that our, our oceans our landfills and our forests are becoming full of microplastics. These plastics are beginning to affect the, sea, the wildlife, the marine life. And if we can continue to change the narrative, they have biodegradable, eco-sustainable hemp packaging, ladies and gentlemen. And that is why I'm very proud of organizations and events such as NOCO to really push the spectrum and broaden the horizons of what we think hemp is and as he stated cbd is everywhere you can get it at your local gas station you know you found it in pharmacies and everywhere you go now so ladies and gentlemen please understand that the hemp industry so this is chapstick we're not being paid by chapstick i do not endorse chapstick as <laughs> an endorser but chapstick is a lip balm that's used to keep your lips moisturized is this the only thing that can be used to moisturize no but it's one product. And if it can moisturize lips, it could potentially moisturize other things. Think about what hemp can do. Hemp can be used everything from CBD drops to go under your tongue, to skincare products, to even potentially tires, rubber, plastic products. I like martial arts. I love MMA. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one of my greatest activities that I love and enjoy. And I see now where Companies that make the jujitsu gis, which we compete, we train in, they're making them out of hemp. And why is that important? Hemp is very friendly when it comes to the ecosystem, but also your skin. You have to think about the antimicrobial properties, the antifungal properties, the antibacterial properties. Everyone who's ever worked out has worked out in some gear and didn't throw it in the washing machine or threw it somewhere and grabbed it a day later and it was still wet. It smells. There is proof that hemp fiber and hemp clothing are stronger, they're more sustainable, and they don't smell as bad when people sweat or have people have to work in stressful conditions on them and get them soiled. So ladies, everyone, please understand that hemp has a limitless of possibilities, but we have to work to control the narrative. Right now, uh, many influencers in the industry have a lot of people convinced that hemp can only make CBD oil and gummies. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between, boys and girls, children of all ages, clothing has been made from hemp for years. Our U.S. dollar was at one point printed on hemp, and I want to see more hemp biofuels. Everyone can agree that right now the cost of fuel is expensive, but it's not going to go down anytime soon, and people are going to continue to use gasoline. So why not expand and actually look? Look at those alternatives and events like NOCO, people like Morris and his team, they're really helping to carry that conversation. Now, getting into some of the alternative materials, you mentioned in guitars. 
I love music. My favorite musicians of all time are Prince and Jimi Hendrix. Tell us about the materials that you're using and how did you come about even attempting to make guitars from him? Well, there was a company that started making guitars in 2013 called Canadian Hemp Guitars. And I invited them out to NOCO in 2014. They didn't make it there. 2015, they had sent a guitar to a guy in Denver who was starting to rep their guitars. And they were just making some boutique one-off prototypes and I got a couple of their guitars and I, I had them build me a couple. And then I asked them if they would private label making guitars for me. And it was it's just a couple of guys that were doing this on the side in Canada and didn't really have the bandwidth to create enough guitars and also ukuleles. They were making these cool little hemp bodied ukuleles and they were taking basically like a hemp matting and then compressing it with some sort of binder which i don't think was super eco-friendly um but i've got a couple of the guitars that they made me but i found the another group in atlanta alpharetta which i was talking to you off air about the french brothers who were making guitar cabinets for jam bands such as jimmy herring and aquarium Res rescue unit um Derek trucks and some other cool guitar player guys that were more eco-friendly and i had those guys start making me some guitar cabinets out of what at the time was Sunstrand board. And now we've switched over using hemp wood out of Kentucky and Canna Grove from the folks over at Hemp Traders, which are both 100% hemp boards that are compressed using the stock and the herd, the fiber herb, the entire stock. And so that's what we're making the bodies of the guitars out of now and the, the guitar cabinets and the amplifiers and the, the amplifiers that we have use hemp cone speakers from Tone Tubby, who's been making hemp cone speakers for 20 years out of San Francisco. And they also uh, white label hemp cones for Eminence, who makes a series called Cannabis Rex. So all of my guitar cabinets and amplifiers either have Tone Tubby speakers or Eminence Cannabis Rex that are made out of 100% hemp cones. Wow. And the instruments all sound really good. They're totally pro instruments. So any like real serious guitar player will pick them up and say, wow, these things are really well built. The, all the hardware is great and they sound good. And people will be able to hear them at NOCO because I'm bringing out a half a dozen guitars and a whole bunch of guitar cabinets. So for everyone in attendance and those who are going to watch this later, <laughs> NOCO is next week, ladies and gentlemen, in Colorado. It is not too late to get your tickets go online you can still attend you can find you a flight if you're close to the area drive out look ladies and gentlemen that looks to me like a hemp guitar pick it is a hemp guitar pick so and hemp plastic guitar picks also hemp guitar straps i just bought three more 100 percent hemp guitar straps that levi's makes so for those of you that know levi's makes 100 percent guitar straps that you can get at sweetwater online as well as Fender makes 100% uh, guitar cables. All the, the wrapping of the guitar cables made out of hemp. So I've got hemp guitar cables and guitar straps that Fender and Levi's are making. So big companies are utilizing the materials to some degree. And they need to use it to more of a degree. And it, there's we shouldn't hate on all these big corporations that <clears throat> necessarily are providing stuff that hasn't been um, very environmentally friendly. We need to convince them as consumers that, hey, you, we, we want more sustainable products. Hemp, uh, you should incorporate hemp into your supply chain. And they are starting to listen, whether that's Adidas, whether that's Nike, whether that's Levi's, Patagonia, there are companies out there that are utilizing hemp and we have to encourage them to use more and more hemp and more eco-based materials because they're the huge companies that need to, to make the switch and help lessen their impact on the planet. And back to cotton, while cotton grown non-organically is bad for the environment, growing it organically and we just have to change our agriculture practices and hemp and cannab and hemp and cotton can work together. I mean, hemp blended T-shirts, hemp and cotton can be best buddies and we can rotate hemp and the cotton together and we can grow it organically and, and really lessen the impact on the earth. So we don't necessarily need to hate on the cotton industry. We need the cotton industry to become better. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And I was actually talking to a um, apparel manufacturer at a CBD expo here in Atlanta last year. And that's what he was looking at. He was like, people think that you have to make the shirt, the hat, the jacket, the pants out of 100% hemp. 
And what his thing was, how can we create a poly blend, a tri-fiber blend? And for, for anyone that may not know what that means, it's taking more than one type of fiber material, combining it with a secondary or even third fiber material to make a sustainable fabric. I was at MJ BizCon. I've been multiple times, and it was one, I think the first time I was at MJ BizCon, I met a gentleman who had a collared shirt buttoned up, and he said that it was made of a hemp fiber blend. I thought that the gentleman had multiple shirts. No. <laughs> By the third or fourth day, he was like, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, this was my experiment. I am a large guy. I sweat a lot. And so I normally have to bring several shirts and sometimes change my shirts during the course of a day at a conference. His experiment was he wore the same shirt every day. By the end of it, he stated that the shirt was not soiled. It did not stink as a lot of time from profusely sweating. We do at some of these events. And that was his experiment to tell people, hey, we should make more hemp shirts. And I was just sitting thinking, and I see we've got Miss um, Kamis, Miss Lakeisha Kamis, and she's down in the South as well. And she states that she loves the versatility of hemp and to protect the plant. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to protect the plant. But where we are now, the plant is becoming protected. But now we have to protect the expansion of it. So as you heard Morris state, Levi's. Fender. And if you've never heard of the term Fender, it is a major musician equipment company, F-E-N-D-E-R. I guarantee you, if you've ever been to a concert, if you've ever seen a live band and you look at their equipments from speakers and cables and guitars, you're probably going to see Fender somewhere. And if they've got hemp guitars, hey, for my drummers, my percussionists out there, let's get some hemp drumsticks. Who knows? They may even be more sustainable than your current drumsticks. So these are things that we've got to continue to push the narrative of. And I heard you mention animal feed. I heard you mention, you know, building construction materials. Why is it important that we continue to expand these conversations because, and, and with the industrial hemp possibilities? And how can we continue to engage others in put, keeping the conversation alive for the possibility of the hemp fiber? Well, with particularly like building materials and some of these materials that we can grow here locally and we don't need to be shipping stuff across the entire planet. When, for example, we've done the Southern Hemp Expo in the Nashville area. We did it in 2018 and 2019. We were going back there here in 2022. Uh, the, the construction forecast for the next 10 years, there's a lot of growth going on in Tennessee in the, the Nashville area. Most of these construction materials, probably 90% of it flies in from outside of the United States. When we can grow materials right here in our own backyard and they don't have to have that uh, carbon footprint from shipping across the world, we can process them here locally or domestically. We've got supply chain issues. We've seen what's happened after this pandemic. All of a sudden we've got holes all over in our supply chain. We've got lumber shortages. We have all these material shortages and hemp is an answer to fixing a lot of this. The more we grow locally and domestically that we can utilize here without having to ship stuff across the world, the way less impact we're going to have on, on what we're, we're building and constructing here. Plus these materials generally continue to sequester carbon, hempcrete, hemp insulation, all these materials that can make up a bulk of any sort of structure uh, continue to sequester carbon. And why would we not want to do that when instead of using concrete and using stuff again that's being shipped all across the world that when it's all said and done has a hundred to five hundred to a thousand times the amount of environmental impact on whatever structure we're creating so it, it just makes sense that we grow this stuff locally we do as much as we can locally it creates jobs it, it lessens our environmental impact and that's going to be the future of society is having localized supply chains where we end up not having the issues that we've had here in the last 12 to 18 to 24 months because who knows when the next pandemic is going to happen hopefully it's going to be another 100 years and we don't have to worry about it but who knows thank you for that and that actually leads me into my next question supply chain 
I have a, I get a lot of input. I get a lot of emails and people reaching out to me like, well, why aren't there more hemp furniture companies? Well, you guys are always talking about hemp. I went to Home Depot. I didn't see hemp bricks for sale. Why, 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 why? Where is it? Where is it? Tell us how can we affect the supply chain and what do we need to do to truly create that supply and demand for a sustainable hemp byproduct industry? Because we know there's millions of pounds of CBD biomass, but what do we need to do to get more farmers engaging and not only from the actual growing side, but from the ag tech side, what do we need to do to continue to push this expansion of the supply chain to make it a feasible commodity? Well, we got to get our government to regulate it correctly, one thing. So the, the market's been chilled because of the oversupply of CBD, which the FDA has not done their job regulating it. And that has affected the entire supply chain from growing this fiber and grain part of the supply chain, which is going to feed this, feed millions and millions of acres. That's what we need. When it comes to cannabinoids, we can supply all the CBD that we possibly need to everybody with probably 30 to 50,000 acres. Whereas if we want to supply the automotive industry, the construction industry, the paper industry, the animal feed industry, the protein industry for human consumption, we need tens of millions of acres. And right now we're under 100,000 acres that we're growing. And most of that has been for CBD. So A, we got to have a government regulatory program that is not going to hinder and obstruct the growth of the industry where investors are going to be, hey, we see that there's money to be made. We see that this is important. And if we do help build out the infrastructure for processing facilities across the country, um, where farmers then know, hey, we want to grow hemp because we know that I can, we can sell it to a processor and a processor can go to Ford or Toyota or to any of the huge construction companies and say, hey, we've got materials that we can supply you for the next three to five years based on contract. What do you guys need? What specs do you need? So there's all these things that have to kind of work out together over the course of the next couple of years to build this out. We, it all has to, to kind of unfold in a way where, okay, the FDA and the USDA have shown that they're going to support the growth of this industry. Investors are going to say, oh, the government supports this. We're going to help build out the infrastructure in these different pockets of the country where we know that the area is going to be good for growing hundreds of thousands of acres that can feed these particular processing plants that in turn can feed these large scale industries. Um, and we, we as consumers have to let companies know that we want more sustainable, better alternatives uh, when we go to buy in the marketplace. We want healthier foods, we want healthier textiles, we want healthier materials when we're going to build our houses so we have healthy homes and we're breathing nice clean air instead of stuff that's off gassing off of our walls and and affecting our kids and creating all these other health issues down the road when if we just lived in healthy homes and wore healthy clothing and ate healthy foods then we would eliminate the need for a lot of this stuff on the back end from the pharmaceutical industry. But then again, then that's where we that's where we are. Does the pharmaceutical industry want a healthy society? Absolutely. And <laughs> that really ties into some of my background. Um, before I got into the medical cannabis education and industrial hemp space, I spent seven and a half years as a firefighter paramedic here in Metro Atlanta. And I learned a lot about emergency medicine and healthcare. And you are so right. From the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to rest at night, we are putting chemicals and products on our body and in our bodies. There are many people that as soon as they wake up, they run straight to the refrigerator and grab orange juice. So you're, you're grabbing sugar and you're grabbing preservatives. The first thing you put in your body, then they get in the shower. They're using all of these different products and many of them contain uh, chemicals that may be contributing to disease processes whether it's your shampoos, whether it's your soap or some of the feminine products that are used. Then you have your toothpaste, you have your deodorant. Some deodorant has been taken off the shelves for containing heavy metals, ladies and gentlemen. So just take, an, take a look at everything around you and how it affects your life, but not only your life, but your health. 
hemp can improve it. Are we saying that hemp is the end all be all substance on the planet Earth that's going to bring symbiosis? No, but it can help. And with your help, we can continue to push this narrative. It can't just be the same Morris's always talking, ladies and gentlemen. It can't be Stanley. It can't be some of your hemp advocates. We need others to join this conversation. There's enough room in the hemp industry for everyone. There's enough room for every business. You just heard him state that we need millions of acres of industrial hemp to make it sustainable. I don't know of a single farm farmer or a company that can truly grow millions of acres effectively and pro and process it. So that leaves room for everyone. For the companies that are doing the processing, they're going to need people to supply them with materials to process. Why is that? Because they're focusing on the decortication. They're focusing on the separation of materials. And for anyone that may not know, as you heard Morris use the term a decorticator a minute ago, imagine a machine that takes a stalk and breaks it apart. It strips one part off that you wanna use for one substance, but then you wanna use the inside of a stalk. So imagine a tree that's cut down, the bark is shaved off and you wanna get the inside material. Well, we know that the hemp fiber plant can be kind of difficult to work with. It's a very tough fibrous material and these decortication efforts haven't changed and the methods haven't really changed in the past couple hundred years. There are a lot of processors who are taking old machinery from the 18 1900s and what they're doing is retrofitting it with today's technology making it electronic to decorticate so we truly have to work on supply demand processes but not only those infrastructure so we're coming near the end of the show morris before we get out of here it's been such a great conversation because i've seen the comments coming in and i'm quite sure there's at least one person that's going to see this that didn't know they had hemp guitar picks uh hemp instruments um the the carbon sequestering and if you don't know what that means it imagine a material that can actually remove carbon from the atmosphere because whether we, many people want to accept it or not, your house emits chemicals. And with the, by, way, and by the way of off-gassing, you have paint somewhere in your house. There is some material somewhere in your house that's coating something. Even though they are minuscule and you know, by the, literally the micrometer, the nanometer, where they're, they're parts per million, it puts off little gases. And if you say that hemp could potentially alleviate that, there's a strong potential that you will see an increase in your health because inside your house, you're always breathing. You know, you're always moving around. You have food in your house. And we really want to continue to push this narrative. So before we wrap up, I want to close out and talking about NOCO. So for those in attendance, and we're going to be sure to share this, be sure to like, subscribe and follow, ladies and gentlemen. Tell us about your next NOCO event, which is upcoming next week. How can they get tickets? When does it start and what should attendees expect from the team over at NOCO? Well, you can find out more information at nocohempexpo.com, which I see running across the bottom there, which is good. So you can get tickets there. You can see the list of all the speakers. You can see the list of the programming from all the conferences that are happening on Thursday and Friday. All of the networking parties where you can get to meet all kinds of folks throughout the entire supply chain. So it's a great place to really connect with people and, and develop new relationships. And this is our eighth annual NOCO. It should be our ninth, but we took 2020 off, not by our own choice, but because that's just the way it was. <laughs> and we are happy to get back face to face with people. People are itching to get out. And I think that we're going to have a really good group of folks out we, we did have to make a venue change at the end. I don't know if we didn't even talk about that, but we were at the Crown Plaza. Crown Plaza canceled us a month out before the show because of a government humanitarian situation going on there. So we have moved to the Gaylord Rockies Resort, which is a beautiful facility, probably the nicest facility in Colorado to hold a convention and a trade show. And so we're excited to be there. They've been very accommodating. We're going to have the best environment that we've ever had for a show. And I think that People coming out now, this is really the reboot of the hemp industry. After two years of pandemic, after a CBD oversupply and people realizing that, hey, industrial hemp is more than CBD, we're going to 
take fiber and grain and carbon sequestration and, and climate initiatives to the next level. And this was going to be the reboot of the hemp industry. And again, everybody can participate from all walks of life. Um, there's opportunity for everyone. And I, I invite everybody out. And like you said, it's not just the Morrises and whoever else talking, oh, there's Melissa Gibson. She's going to be on the show too, or she's going to be at NOCO speaking as well. Um, we need millions of people advocating for this to create that narrative that you've been talking about. It is our narrative. We see the narrative that Fox News or CNN or the New York Times or any of these mainstream media outlets have. We have our own narrative and our narrative isn't one to deceive people. Our narrative is a narrative that's going to try to make the world a better place. And we're going to keep preaching that narrative and speaking it day in and day out. And it has to come from people besides Stanley and besides me. We need millions of people out there speaking this narrative for the future of our kids and their kids. I could not agree more. <laughs> so for everyone that's watching, it's not just me. It's not just Morris. You too are a part of the hemp industry. You if you've never grown a plant, you've never touched a plant, that does not mean that you don't have a place in this industry. It is so much more vast than just growing, plant touching. Like you said, there's supply, there's technology, there's processing, there's distribution, there is even inventory management, everyone. So understand that whatever skill that you have, whatever job or task that you've ever performed, you could potentially do it in the hemp industry. Morris, I want to be sure to stay in touch with you. I would love to come out to the next. Uh, I couldn't make this one. Um, I'd love to come out and potentially even speak at one of your NOCO events and collaborate with you guys because I love the work that you're doing. And I would have to just be transparent with you. I like the clarity of which you present your information. Oh, there's, thank you. there's no smoke screens. He's not a soapbox salesman, ladies and gentlemen. As you see, he didn't even try to sell you anything today. He was here. All he wanted you to pay was attention. And I really hope that you did because it takes events like NOCO who are putting countless hours in to make sure that our industry is not only sustainable, but equitable. An equitable industry is good for everyone, every race, every creed, every religion, every sexuality. You have a place in the yep. hemp industry. And I would love to see. And if you're going to support us, please be sure to support NOCO. Look up their NOCO events. Follow them on social media. Set your alerts. Get on their email list. There are a lot of events, a lot of webinars, a lot of conferences. And if you want to be in the know, then you have to know. And NOCO is a great opportunity for you to come out, to collaborate, to network. And if nothing else, go learn. If you say, hey, I'm an introvert, I don't know about these conferences and you know, shaking everyone's hands and introducing myself, then I tell you what, have someone on your team that's that, that, opening, that opening picture, have you a closer on your team. You may just be the relief. You go around, you get business cards, educate yourself. Don't be afraid to ask questions. In this industry, we need more questions asked, but with those questions, it is up to people like us to begin to offer those solutions. I have a consulting company known as the Stanley Group, and industrial hemp is our primary focus. How can we be a positive mark on what's in many places been a dark industry? There are tens of thousands of farmers that are sitting with thousands of pounds of hemp. It's time for us to help them. And we can help them by, again, changing the way we look at hemp, but also our approach to hemp byproducts and sustainability. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Mr. Morris Beagle from the WAFBA and also from NOCO. Morris, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know it's early out there in Colorado, but your input has been amazing. I am also very excited about these hemp instruments. I love to hear some of these bands. Hey guys, if you and your band want to play, get you some hemp instruments. I guarantee you, you'll get some more attention just because people want to see what hemp can do. So be sure to follow NOCO. Reach out to myself. I am Stanley Atkins II. Many of you know me as the Canamedic for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. And please stay tuned as we will be hosting our first ever Sow the Land Industrial Hemp Symposium, June 17th and 18th. 
in Georgia. Yes, we're going down and working with Fort Valley State University at their event center. We will have one of Georgia's first symposiums that's not just going to work on products and selling products, but also the aspects and potentiality of hemp. It's time to get those processors in the room with those farmers. It's time to get those accountants in the room with the web developers. Everyone needs to see how they can work in synergy. And as you see on the screen, hemp means sustainability. And without sustainability, nothing will last. It is up to us to continue to control how this plant is approached, not only on the local level, not only on the state level, but at the federal level. We know we've got the 2022 Farm Bill coming up, so it's time for some changes. Talk to your local legislator. Tell them that you watched the webinar featuring a guy that's, hey, from NOCO. And if your legislator doesn't know what NOCO is, shoot them the website, email them, tell them to educate themselves. And if all else fails, go visit NOCO. Find out their upcoming events, get you a ticket, and put yourself in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Stanley Atkins II, your National Director of Hemp Farming and Technology for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Be sure to stay tuned as we offer a variety of programming in our upcoming events. We have Health as Wellness featuring Nicole Buffon. The first Friday of every month, we have First Fridays. We have Can I Talk with Roz. We have Cashing Out on Cannabis featuring Simone Kaysan. And please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe not only Minorities for Medical Marijuana, but also NOCO Hemp. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Morris. And this has been your this month's edition of So the Land presented by Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Be sure to tune in next month. We have another guest for you with some more information. And for those who left comments, I hope that you all get to see each other at NOCO. Thank you again, and we'll see you next month.